We're here today on July 12th and we're with Steve McComas. We're going to do a survey of some of the weeds in the lake or native plants, Steve. How long right. have you been working on bald eagle? We started doing plant surveys in the mid-90s and there have been plenty of work done prior to that so it's been a nice continuous record going back, oh, at least to the 80s. So we've been tracking these things on an annual basis for a number of years. Can you explain to folks what a plant survey entails and how you go about it? It's a systematic survey. It's semi-quantitative. Look at the camera. Look so at the camera. We're going to go out here at probably 80 or 90 or 100 spots that we check every year and we'll check those same spots again and we go at various depths, shallow water, medium depth of water and, and deep water and then we see what the species are and we also check the abundance. So we know the distribution and the abundance and the number of species. And you go to the same spots every year and yes. I think it's called a delineation, right? Well, we have a couple things, a couple different types of surveys. A delineation is just looking to see where the plants are growing. But the systematic survey, the plant survey, is a little bit more quantitative and a little bit more involved. And you've been going to the same spots every year for the 20 years. Do you find the same stuff in every year? No, no. Every year it's a little bit different. But for the most part, the plants in Bald Eagle have been pretty stable from the standpoint that of, growing, of how far they're growing out in depth and the species. But year to year, they can change not only the number of species, but also their distribution and then their abundance. So that's what we want to check, because if we start seeing a big decline, we want to be able to stop that and see what's going on. But an annual variation, that's, that's normal. But now that we've done the alum treatments twice, we find uh, things are quite a bit different, right? Yes. We have much clearer water now. It gives it a better light field for aquatic, for rooted aquatic plant growth. So our rooted plants are now going to be probably more abundant and also the product growing out in deeper water. My experience is that the weed line used to be eight to seven to eight feet. That's right. And I think now it's maybe as much as 13 around the lake. Is that right? It could be, and it might not be done yet. These plants are still adjusting to the new clarity conditions, so we'll see. That's why it's good to be tracking this on an annual basis to see how it might change. Now, I was out here with you in early June, and I think that you said that we found 14 or 15 different species of native plant. Is that right? That's right. And if I recall, you were kind of surprised at two particular plants. One, I think, was buttercup pondweed. And the other one was white stem something. White stem pondweed. Okay. Right. Those are both native plants, and they have not been very abundant and not been very well distributed in the past. And this this year, for example, poof, they're all over the place. You, saw, you found acres and acres of them in spots, primarily closer to shore That's than right. in the bays, right? That's right. And uh, buttercup had a white flower on it, and I thought it looked like snow on the lake. Right. Right. Also, that can be confused sometimes with milfoil because milfoil will put out sometimes a little whitish flower on its uh, flower stalk as well. But that was definitely buttercup. And so it's always good to know what the native plants are, where they are, and then the non native plants like the Eurasian milfoil. And could you tell folks what the white stem pondweed is like? The white stem pondweed has these long, narrow leaves that come off the stem, but they usually grow uh, almost individually. They're not bedded together and matted like Eurasian water milfoil is. So white stem pondweed is a very nice, high quality and desirable plant for fish and also for water quality. And this year there was a lot of it on bald eagle, and if I remember, I saw it eight, nine, ten feet of water, and it was thick. That's right, yeah. Now, if you could spend a little time explaining the, I know that you use a rake. What's the rake deal and how does it work? The rake is just our sampling tool. How are you going to sample these plants? If you just look down in the water, you'll see a lot of them, but you won't see all of them. So the rake gets down to the bottom and gives us a good representative sample. The rake doesn't probably get 100%, but it gets a lot of the plants and a good systematic approach. So it's the same type of sampling approach from site to site. And the rake then, as we pick it up, we can talk about the abundance based on how full the rake is. And then also we can get then uh, the idea of the individual species associated with that spot. And when I was along 
Joel would say, we got one of these and one of those, and, and somehow you guys knew what was what. That's right. Yep. <laughs> and then when you talk about the abundance, that's how much stuff is on the rake. That's right. We have a, an abundant scale from one to four. We use the DNR scale. And if you only have a few little stems on the rake, that's a one. Okay. And if the rake is just full of plants, that's a four. And then two and three are in between that. And you record this as you go around the lake? For each species, we will assign an abundance. So then when we get done, not only do we have the distribution of the plants and the species, but we also have a relative idea of their abundance. One of the things that people are concerned about is, is the, the, there's a lot of thick stuff and it's troubling for them to, to uh, boat around and swim. And I think some people call them weeds and they call them nuisance weeds. What's the difference between a nuisance weed and a, a native aquatic plant? It's all subjective because what's a nuisance to one person might not be a nuisance to another person. That's why we don't really call them nuisance or non-nuisance. We give them a density rating of one to four. And a lot of times folks will decide, you know, if that's a nuisance growth or not. But if you're a fish, there aren't very many nuisance plants out there. Okay. And the DNR, the state of Minnesota, has regulations about what you can do and where. Could you explain to us what a homeowner can do? The homeowners have a riparian area, which is from their shoreline out to 150 feet, and that is something that they have some control over. Even though there's waters of the state and the plants belong to the state, the homeowners can still manage those plants in front of their place. They can go without a permit and they can clear 2,500 square feet or half of their property uh, shoreline length, whichever is less. So a 50 by 50 foot spot you can clear without a permit and that would be 2,500 square feet. If you want to do more than that, you can, but you'll need a permit from Minnesota DNR to do that. And if I'm not mistaken, when you say clear, that's by pulling the stuff somehow. That's right. Pulling and mechanically cutting, but you need a permit if you're going to do any herbicide at all. So the, what the homeowners can do without a permit is cutting, raking, pulling, and physically removing plants, but not the use of herbicides without a permit. And they can do that with any kind of plant. If, it, if right. they find a rose in there, they can pull the rose. That's right. And what can be done in areas outside of that 150 feet? Oh, there's still, oh, once you get deeper than that, that's called, that's refer to that as open water. Deeper, then, deeper. <coughs> I'm sorry, further out from shore than 150 feet. Okay. Once you get past 150 feet, that's considered now to be open water, kind of a community lake. And then there you need a, an organization to, to handle that type of an application for control. And the, in the past, the Bald Eagle Area Association had done that, I think back in the 70s and on, and then I think that it was taken over by Race Creek in about 2003, 2004. They took over the, the management of curly leaf pondweed, which is a non-native plant. And so the watershed district looked at curly leaf as a potential water quality uh, uh, problem, and that by controlling curly leaf, they could then actually have some beneficial impact to the water quality. But they have not been routinely managing native plants or the other non-native plants like Eurasian water milfoil. If the Bald Eagle Area Association wanted to do something, they would be limited to doing it in areas where there were invasive plants, correct? Uh, in the open water, that is mostly correct. You can still harvest out there, and you can harvest the non-nuisance, or you can harvest the non-native species, for example, if they're a problem. You could theoretically get a permit, but only if it's really a uh, navigational or recreational problem. How likely is that to be outside of the 150 feet? Well, we have some clear water now. It didn't used to be a problem because the, the poor water clarity limited plants to relatively shallow growing depths. Now with better clarity, we're gonna have plants growing out deeper. You might get some heavy growth past or deeper than 150 feet or further out from 150 foot mark. What kind of plants are there out there now that are getting thick to the point where they're troublesome, do you know? There might be some species like coontail, could be a potential heavy grower. 
and then there might be some other native plants that occasionally uh, will, will sprout and produce uh, heavy growth like white stem pondweed or buttercup. But I wouldn't expect those to be a perennial problem, meaning I don't think they'd be a problem every year. With these clear water conditions, the plants are responding sometimes rapidly, but on a short-term basis. We've been told, if my memory serves, that the lake is going to balance itself out, that it's going to take two or three years, and then things are going to start to get a little more normal. Is that correct? That is a typical case, that these plants aren't going to sustain that type of real, real heavy, abundant growth on an annual basis. They're going to use up the nutrient pool, and then it's not going to be replenished very fast. What happens now is that the clear water, they're able to grow in areas where they weren't able to grow before, there is a nutrient pool in the sediments that they can then use. Once that's kind of used up, if it's not replenished, then the plant growth will also be diminished. How are these plants all of a sudden going out an extra five feet? What, somebody spread the seed or how did that work? You know, think about this. This lake is probably 10,000 years old. That seed bank is well distributed throughout the whole lake. They can sit there for decades, the seeds, and under right conditions, they'll sprout. Yeah, quite a thick growing condition here. This would be very treatable um, and not easy to boat through. And you can see here it is Eurasian milfoil. Well, it's at a density of a four anyway. And so at a four, a lot of times you would look at that as possibly being a treatable condition. And you can see that uh, it's going to get caught in the props. It's going to be... Uh, it's a navigational hindrance. Not that you can still go through it, but... It also adds the brownish color to a large degree is what you call attached algae growth or periphyton. And that is keeping the, the plant from being a, a brilliant green. So this algae that's growing now on the leaves or the leaflets of milfoil is giving it that, that off color. It's still, everything is alive. It certainly though is not growing at a peak rate right now. By that I mean if it was rapidly growing it would grow faster than the periphyton can attach and grow so it would be a, it would be a greener situation. So the milfoil has slowed down right now at this time of the year. I'm kind of talking about its distribution and abundance. It is now probably going to be pretty stable. It's not going to grow much more than it is right now. This is pretty much its peak condition. Because of all the attached algae growth we can see that if it was still rapidly growing, it you know, can grow an inch or two a day. It's already done that, and now it's kind of settled down. And it's not dormant, it's still alive, but it has a lot of attached algae growth on it. Are there new little baby uh, milfoils trying to grow up? Yeah, there is one right there. So you can see that there's still some sprigs here that are uh, greener than some of the other ones, which means that that's just, it's, still kind of, it's still kind of growing. It's a, that's a little bit newer, you know, it's, it's probably it's branched off here in the last week or so. But, and Steve, are there, are there new plants growing from the bottom, or is this just what it is? It's not ah, going to... Probably both, but the ones coming up from the bottom are going to be slow growing. What happens now is that you can see some of these stems are branching. And so they get within a foot or two of the surface and they'll branch. And that's what gives you the, a lot of times, your matted growth of Eurasian milfoil. And that's what seems to be happening in this area right here. And this one right here, for example, is a little bit greener than some of the other brownish things. This is rapid, this is still growing, and paraphyton hasn't, hasn't attached to that, uh, to those leaflets yet. Versus this one right here, which is older. Older. Newer. Tell me what these para somethings are. Well, paraphyte or paraphyton. It's just paraphyton is always an algae uh, name, and paraphyton means it's it's algae growing on plants. So it's a does this paraphyton is just an attached algae growth on these individual leaflets here, whereas this does not have much attached algae growth yet. But that algae there is also helping um, keep the water clear. And the paraphytons are native or non-native? Oh, yeah, yeah, native <clears throat> algae. All Just, over, every place? Yep, yep. Well, blue-greens don't typically, <clears throat> blue-greens don't typically attach like that. So that's going to be diatoms, chrysophytes, 
a whole variety of different types of uh, algal species. And do they uh, do they also form on native plants and cause the same yes, they browning? Do. Yes, they do. And we'll, so, fi we'll find some of that. Yes, when you see cabbage, a lot of times you'll see an, uh, almost like a crust. Now sometimes that is calcium carbonate, but oftentimes it's a consortium of microbes, algae, and even some of those precipitates which are calcium carbonate. died down, not died off, but died down, and now it's a little bit patchier from that standpoint that it's in, it's in clumps or in patches. We have some milfoil within a foot of the surface, and another milfoil that is down now maybe two or three feet, and it's not a big navigational problem. So when we treat this area, we would probably refine the polygon, refine the area that we did in June because there's some areas here that it doesn't seem to be a real problem. These stem densities are not high enough to have a real problem for a fish. They can still swim in and out of there. So for fish habitat, it's just fine. But from, a, from the human perspective, you know, we, it's a little bit of a hindrance in terms of our recreational use. That's all part of the recreational aspect. For the uh, folks, we're about 100 yards off of the fishing pier to the west of it right now. Maybe 200 yards from the boat launch. Okay. Now, now we have enough milk for you. This is a this is a tributary we had to in earlier, and it's still there. Now it's about a foot or so from the surface, but this is probably a treatable area. Why do you say that? Because we were only in mid-July, and it still has all of July and August to grow. It very well could grow slowly, but still be present and cause some problems. So this could be a treatable area. Treatable because we want to get rid of the milfoil, or because we want to uh, solve the nuisance issue? Solve the recreational hindrance, the navigational issue, yes. That's the only reason that we would be treating that. And for fishermen too, to a degree, we have a fishing pier right here that, uh, you know, it would be a little bit easier to fish with uh, a, a, a more reduced, more sparse uh, canopy. What do you got here, Connor? And that's a native plant there. So that's clasping leaf pondweed right there. We've got a lot of matted stuff here, and I'm thinking it's going to be releasing phosphorus. Yeah. And the curly leaf releases phosphorus. What's what's the difference? Why do we care about the curly leaf phosphorus and not this? That's a good question. Well, this is going to be releasing phosphorus when it decomposes. However, we're only talking about maybe five, ten acres of buttercup. That's the floating plant right now. Most of the native plants are still in place and are still growing, actively growing and not releasing phosphorus. In this lake and other lakes, sometimes we can have 100, 150 acres of curly leaf. It all dies back about the same time with the potential to put out phosphorus then. Now, not all the phosphorus goes into algae. Some of it goes into microbes and other things, but it has the potential to uh, uh, stimulate algae blooms. And it's gonna degrade the water quality <clears throat> at a time when people are wanting to use the lake for swimming. And That's right. Curly leaf dies back right about, you know, early July, which would then go just about the time the blue-green algae is starting to kick in, and that can give fuel to the blue-greens for, you know, enhanced growth, a lot of growth. Steve, we're in the, what I'll say is the north side of uh, Benson's Bay, where there's a number of homes, and it looks as if these folks here might have done the 50 by 50 area because it mm. seems to be pretty clear all along this shoreline. Do you agree? Yeah, it looks. It, it does look clear. There's not much milfoil here at all. And there's nothing on the surface to speak of. 
just little patchy growth. And we have some native plants right down here that are still coming up though, but yeah, the water's clear and it shouldn't be much of a navigational problem here at this point. Okay. There's not much milfoil right here. That's mostly white stem pondweed, some buttercup, and I saw some water celery over there. But it's at a lower density and it's a foot or so, foot or two below the surface. So from a navigational standpoint, you know, it's better. Steve, that's an area where the homeowner treated it with herbicide sometime within the past couple of weeks? Yes, probably about, uh, yeah, two or three weeks ago. Okay. And the milfoil is pretty much gone. He treated for milfoil, and if you do it right, the herbicides are somewhat selective for Eurasian milfoil and leave the native plants alone. That's all northern milfoil. Not all, maybe not all of it. Yeah, but I wouldn't, I don't know if I would, you know, I don't know if I would, if you try to treat for Eurasian. Yeah, I got Eurasian. Yeah, this is all, look at this. This is northern. Things, stem densities are similar. Yeah, I am seeing some hybrid in here. So this is hybrid and northern. Steve, let's go around the corner over there by the uh, outlet to Otter Lake and see what we find. Absolutely. Okay, that's curly. <laughs> There's some curly leaf growing, re-sprouting. Otherwise, yeah, that's, that's, it's uh, Eurasian milfoil. Yeah. Tell but see, I wouldn't treat here. that. I wouldn't treat that. Steve, tell us where we're at here. We are in the uh, the a cove where Otter Lake comes into Bald Eagle Lake on the west side of Bald Eagle. I would not treat that last sample. Okay, that looks like um, some milfoil. But, uh, yeah, that's not enough to, uh, not dense enough to treat, that's not, but we we'll get shallower, we have something growing. We're getting to the point now where it's at the surface. It's up a little bit, but then here's some more. We're about 200, 225 feet from shore. So this would be a potential Lake Association area to consider. And up here, a lot of that heavy growth is within 150 feet. That's mostly milfoil. Kind of, is this a hybrid or is this northern? That looks like hybrid. To me, like hybrid. Yeah, there's some buttercup in there also. Yeah, that's hybrid. I'm also getting northern milfoil. Yeah, yeah, there's a mix of that in here. Are you seeing any natives here, Steve? Yeah, there's a little bit of buttercup, a little bit of coontail. A little bit of northern milfoil, which is the native milfoil. Buttercup sitting on top of a milfoil. So the milfoil is actually kind of holding it up. So here we have milfoil sporadically, you know, occasionally at the surface. And here it's a little bit more at the surface, but that is buttercup on top of it. And some other plants in there too, including some milfoil. So that is a native plant called coontail. It looks a little bit like Eurasian milfoil. It's crunchier. It doesn't have a specific leaflet 
Brax. And then um, Tom's pulling up some clasping leaf pondweed, which looks a bit like curly leaf, but it's a native plant. And this is a nice, highly desirable fish attractor as well. A lot of times fishermen are looking for clasping leaf beds because that's, uh, that'll hold fish. And it's right in the middle, <clears throat> right in the middle of, uh, of this milfoil. Correct? Yes, it is, yep. It's mixed in, so we have a mix here of natives and non-natives, including, um, and here's that hybrid. You can see it's branched a little bit, and that's why at the surface it is uh, kind of tough to motor through, especially when it branches forms a mat. Steve, we've been motoring along uh, the, east, the west shore of Bald Eagle, right there the outlet to Otter Lake, and we're right by the open space right now, and you've consistently seen milfoil. That's right. I think that you said something a minute ago about what you expected to see along this west side of the lake and whether or not it would be treatable. Well, it would be treatable, it's just that there's so much of it. This seven to nine foot depth is probably gonna hold milfoil, the hybrid, the Eurasian, and the native milfoil in a band going from the Otter Lake inflow almost all the way to the south end of this west side. So right now it is uh, close to the surface and in, at the surface at the same time what you could call patchy because it's not one solid mat but it has this patchiness where you have some beds that are coming coming together and hitting the surface then there's some open spots so do you treat that or not as I've studied some of the materials that you've produced over the years I don't recall you showing this as being that thick of an area with milfoil. No. Uh, about four or five years ago, there was a substantial treatment effort for the hybrid milfoil on this stretch. And it's the only time that I can recall that milfoil popped up like that. Otherwise, this stretch of shoreline has had milfoil before, but not nearly, to, not nearly this abundant. And would you attribute that to the luck of the draw or the the um, clearer water or what? I would think the driver here for the most part is clearer water. Clearer water, at the same time, I don't think this is going to be sustained year after year. And that by that next year this could be completely different. So I think we have a couple years here with the clear water conditions. Plants are going to be very abundant and then after that they settle back down into more of a, a more of an equilibrium state which is more stable and will have fluctuate from year to year but won't generally produce this type of growth on an annual basis. I'm going to remind you that I, back in 1988, 1989, you did surveys and you and Ramsey County between 87, 88 and 89 said there was no Eurasian milfoil in Bald Eagle Lake. Is your memory good enough to recall that? I recall milfoil on um, the lake. Your report says none. It, the report says northern milfoil and we were having trouble finding it. But at the same time we weren't aware that a lot of this milfoil could have been the hybrid milfoil. So a lot of that milfoil probably was misidentified. So you might have made a mistake? I might have made a mistake. That's too. But it, I wasn't stumped. <laughs> 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 no, I think uh, for years we've been calling milfoil, milfoil, milfoil yeah. when probably it was a mix of a hybrid in there as well. This, this hybrid showed up uh, relatively early. It's, but you know, even though it's like a foot below the surface, my goodness, it's only mid-July. Yes, you're right. Well, you're going to be an expert at the plants. Yeah, that's a combination of hybrid and northern, huh? I've seen quite a bit of northern, but also only a fair amount of... Now here it's putting up seed stalks. So that's good, because once it puts up seed stalks, it'll, it'll collapse back a foot or so. But boy, 
It's not done growing yet. That's, is that Cara? It's not all Cara, but you can smell it. A real distinctive odor. They also call Cara muskgrass. So when you put it up in, uh, it's very distinctive, but that's, uh, that's Cara. That's a macro algae. Yes and no. Uh, at the same time, we can't have both clear water and, and uh, lots of plants. So it's kind of a balance. Especially in a bay like this where it's... Now here's clasping feet. leaf. So you're right, um, generally grow Greg, there is some um, clasping leaf here, but, but that stuff up there is white overall, stem. Overall, we're going for good water quality. The difference would be clasping leaf, water, you actually get the leaves clasping that stem it's not always and we'll grab right, wait till you get done talking. Areas. yeah we'll grab some white stem to make kind of show the difference mm -hmm. leaves are thicker than clasping leaf I mean wider and the the leaves don't go all don't wrap themselves around the stem like clasping leaf does clasping leaf clasps the stem what species is this? Is this? That's white stem. Check to see how clear the water is. I'll lower the disc down on this measuring tape to see how far I can see the secchi disc down at the bottom. And that gives us an idea of how far the light penetrates down into the water. I was um, on Fountain Lake yesterday. One foot transparency. What do you got? For midsummer, and that's where we are right now, if you can get five to seven feet, that's pretty good. So for the Secchi disc, I got 10.3 feet. Yeah, that's good. 10.3 feet. What would you normally find this time of the year in Bald Eagle? Can you recall, Steve? Yeah, probably three to four feet. And that difference is totally due to the alum treatment, correct? And, then, and that alum, yes. And what that alum did is tied up the phosphorus in the bottom sediments because this, the lake sediments themselves were a source of phosphorus to the algae growth. So by trapping and locking up the phosphorus with the alum, you reduce the phosphorus, you reduce the algae growth, which in turn increases the clarity. So that's how alum kind of works. But it, it was very carefully uh, studied to make sure that that would improve conditions. Sometimes you can use alum; you won't see them. You won't see an improvement if the main phosphorus source is not the lake sediments. In this case, after probably a good 10 years or more of study, all indications were that the sediments were a big factor. So that's why pretty expensive alum project was considered and implemented and it looks like they were right it looks like the sediments were in fact a big problem otherwise we wouldn't have seen this type of an improvement so you didn't that's... get any weeds on your anchor <laughs> no weeds that 30 feet yet oh another rule of thumb for plant growth It'll, it'll go to about twice your secchi disc depth, but your minimum secchi disc depth. So we have 10 feet right now. I don't think that's probably, we'll probably get less than that. But we have the potential for plants to grow up to 18 to 20 feet. Now they won't grow to the surface at those depths, but there could be some growth down there at, that, at, that, at those depths based on the secchi disc and based on that rule of thumb of twice your minimum secchi disc.
those kind of plants would be? Probably be um, low light sensitive plants. And those would be like sago pondweed, maybe some coon tail, maybe some flat stem pondweed, maybe some milfoil. But at 20 feet, they would probably would never make it to the surface. They might only grow up four or five feet because the light's pretty low down there. But uh, that helps sustain good water quality in the long run too. So, Steve, we're getting close to the end of the day here. Is there anything else that you think that we need to explain to the people, the folks on Bald Eagle Lake? Probably the main point would be to be ready to act, but don't overreact. And that is when we see a year or two of this rapid and rampant plant growth, let's, let's act, but also be aware that it could very well settle down into a lower level, stable state in three or four years and probably stay like that. So in the meantime, uh, there will be some changes in the lake mean, uh, from the standpoint of weed growth, plants, uh, going, the fish are going to be moving and, and uh, their habitats are going to change. So fishermen are going to have to change a little bit too.